Organizers are warning Democrats not to take black voters for granted ahead of the midterms. That's according to recent reporting from The Hill's Cheyenne M. Daniels. Advocates who spoke to The Hill expressed frustration that the Democratic Party consistently overlooks black voters until it's too late. Polling released last month shows the black voters' top concern is, as expected, the economy. Nearly half of respondents said their financial situation is bad and that they've had difficulties paying for household expenses over the past year. Joining us now to weigh in is our rising panel. Terrence Woodbury is CEO and founding partner of Hit Strategies, a public opinion research firm targeting young people and communities of color. And Malik Abdul is a Republican strategist. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, Terrence, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, given that black voters, according to this poll, their top concern is the economy, which, you know, matches um, with ev everybody else, basically. Um, I, I guess it's my question would be, is it then, you know, when we're talking to organizers or activists um, around, um, I guess, black issues or minority issues, do they speak for the larger community if the larger community's top concerns you know, closely map what the general population's top concerns are. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You know, uh, we conduct, we've conducted over 300 focus groups and about 30,000 interviews with black voters since the 2020 election. And we're hearing very, very similar concerns. Black voters are acutely aware of the role that they play delivering this president to the White House and delivering Democrats uh, control over both chambers. And that awareness comes with expectation. That awareness comes with the with the expectation that Democrats will reduce the economic and social pains that black communities are facing. And frankly, I believe that this administration has a messaging problem more than a governing problem, because when we look at the economic priorities of the black community, this administration has, in fact, made significant progress on things like uh, like the child tax credit that reduced black child poverty by 20 percent raising federal minimum wage to $15. There's a half a million black federal employees whose minimum wage went up to $15. And so progress is happening. It is not enough. There is still significant pain in the black community, but it is incumbent on this administration over the next 80 days to tell black voters how they have made their lives materially better. Well, I, I want to stick with you with that for a second, Terrence, because you, know, you mentioned the child tax credit Democrats bragged about it having uh, child poverty. Then it, it expired, and it, they weren't able to get a continuation of the child tax credit in this latest uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act bill. Uh, you mentioned the federal $15 minimum wage. I applaud that effort, but the national $15 minimum wage was a core part of Biden's own agenda. It was a promise that he made to Bernie Sanders when Bernie Sanders uh, dropped out of the race without much of a fight. And you know that obviously has not come to fruition. And there are issues that disproportionately affect uh, black people that are also core to Biden's campaign promises, including the stimulus checks that are still front of mind for a lot of people, which never came through in their entirety, and this big promise to cancel student loan debt. Specifically, Biden said, and people have memory hold this, that he would cancel all student loan debt for graduates of historically black colleges and universities making under $125,000 a year. He's not done that or followed through on his promise to do a blanket $10,000 at least of cancellation for everyone across the board. So staring down the barrel of those kinds of concerns and the, that, that framing that shows that Biden seems to have reneged on many of these promises, you know, how do you see that? that playing out with voters in midterms? Yes, you know, I think that black voters have unfinished business in 2022, that, that, that because of the progress that has been made, when you look at student loans, while he has not forgiven student loans, uh, no one has had to pay a federal student loan since he's been president. And that is the first president that can say that. While well, he has well, not forgiven student loans, yeah. he has reduced the interest rates to 0% at a time where interest rates are rising. And so I'm not telling black voters to take his word for it. I'm telling them to look at his actions and his actions are progress and it is relief if it is not full, uh, full forgiveness.
Yeah, of course, the student loan moratorium, he's threatening to lift it at the end of the month right before midterms. And it was, in fact, Donald Trump who instituted the moratorium in the first place. Malik, I want to bring you in here. What, what do you make of this uh, priority on the economy and whether or not Joe Biden has done enough to fulfill his own campaign promises, uh, much less meet the needs of the black public at this time? And so I actually approached this as someone who started looking at these things when I was a Democrat during the George Bush administration, when I was supporting Barack Obama and many of the criticisms that people had of the Barack Obama administration was that he was not focused enough. He didn't do enough for black people. It had the same thing happened under the Trump administration. And now we're here with the Biden administration. I actually think that Robbie touched on it um, a bit when he talked about that at the end of the day, the things that really impact the um, black community at least as far as what the federal government is able to do, we, our, our issues aren't much different than the rest of America. Yes, econ the economy actually ranks at the top of the list of our issues. But when we have these conversations, we typically center around those things like criminal justice reform, um, you know, p police, uh, police reform and things like that. Sure, those things are actually important. But I think a number of the things that we talk about, like those particular things there, these are things that happen at the local level. So I think that what we have done, we have kind of carried out this notion that somehow the federal government but for federal intervention, things won't impact our lives. But almost all of the things that impact us, whether it's lower taxes, whether it's our schools, whether it's crime, all of these things actually happen at the local level. So I think there's a disconnect between what the federal government actually does and what the local government does. I can say that there are a number of things that the Biden administration has done around minor minority business development. Um, you can add the, the, the climate change. You can add the funding for HBCUs. A number of these things that the Biden administration has done, but they are consistent with what the federal government does when it comes to targeting communities. I don't know if there's going to be any sort of specific thing that is absolutely germane to the black community that the that the federal government itself does, even if we're talking about, you know, student loan cancellation, well, not every black person actually, in fact, most black people act, don't have student loan debt. That's important, but that's not something that the whole of black America is really focused on, which is why it doesn't rank well. Things like voter reform, all of those things, sure, they are great. You know, the, 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 the Biden administration definitely can focus on those things. But I really think we need to have open and honest conversations about what the federal government does, what our local government does, and acknowledge that many of the things that we care about are the same things that every, every other community in this country cares about. Hey, I do take that point, Malik. I will push back and say that black voters support student debt cancellation in higher rates than any other voters. 84% of black voters support student debt cancellation. And the reason being may be that black voters have a disproportionate amount of student debt, even though, of course, not all black voters have student debt, just like all white voters don't have student debt, just like all voters are not impacted by pretty much any policy you can pick from a list. But I do take your point that what affects black voters is largely what affects all voters. I don't know that that gets Biden off the hook, given his overall inconsistent um, uh, uh, posit you know, uh, polling numbers with respect to people's impression of how well he's done to serve the public. Obviously, he's having a better week this week with the passage of the IRA. And and some people argue the fact that he has been off the grid a little bit uh, as he has been dealing with COVID. But the reality of the situation is that whether or not we're talking about these generalized things or more specific programs that are framed as black issues, like criminal justice issues, many people see Joe Biden as coming up short. Uh, you know, Terrence, at what point do we say, yes, we're talking about broad economic issues, but every single time I engage with family members, every single time I go into a comment section of a political video on a black website, I see people talking about two things. I see them talking about the stimulus checks, still saying, where is my stimmy, Joe Biden? You promised me my stim stimulus check. And they're talking about student debt cancellation. Is that really not a concern for, for you and, and people who are working on uh, mobilizing black voters? That months before midterms, Joe Biden is talking about lifting the moratorium that you um, so rightly kind of lauded. Absolutely. You know, and I think that economic uh, security, ec economic justice, cost of living, jobs and wages, while those are all very important issues to the black community, like all, uh, all communities, black voters are not a monolith. And so when you do look at the top issue priorities of black voters, Economy is always in the top three, but so is 
combating racism. Uh, so is health care. And so when we look at the broad issue issue context here, there is there there's a broader story to tell beyond the, the advancements that he's made to try and shore up the economy beyond creating over six million jobs. You got to look at what he's done with criminal justice reform, because that was a primary issue going into the 2020 election coming off of the summer of unrest coming off of the summer of, 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 of George Floyd's death. That was a top concern for black voters. And so when you look at what the Justice Department has done of banning chokeholds for federal officers, banning no-knock warrants for federal officers, establishing a national registry of police misconduct, and most important for black voters, is bringing uh, uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and even the Buffalo shooters to justice using federal hate crime, uh, uh, federal hate crime laws. That this is progress that is that 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 is that represents justice and does represent uh, promises being upheld, but only if they know about it. And unfortunately, too many black voters do not give credit to this administration for that progress because they don't even know what's happening. Well, but but frankly, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree uh, that those are top concerns. I, I, look, I I would support <laughs> most of the policies you outlined there, banning chokeholds, um, no-knock raids, uh, justice for Breonna Taylor, all those things. But, you know, I don't know how many times we have to do this where we, when you poll people who were affected by the summer of unrest, black people whose communities uh, you know, in, endured lo looting and burning, et cetera, you find from a lot of them, a lot of communities of color, that they wanted, you know, not the kind of criminal justice paradigm being uh, uh, pushed on them by, you know, elite white liberals, but they want, uh, they're, they're worried about crime in their communities. They want more enforcement. They don't want more chokeholds. They don't want more no-knock raids. Yes, agree. those things are bad, absolutely. But uh, it, see, it looks to me like a mismatch between what a lot of the elite discourse says this community wants and what the community actually wants. What's your, what's your view of that, Malik? Yeah, yeah, so I'm I sorry. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And that's why I focus on local versus federal. A lot of those things that we're talking about, banning chokeholds, no not warrants, all of those things are actually can be handled at the local level. On the subject of police reform and how much better Joe Biden is on it, I actually will push back with my colleague there. I don't know if he's better on that, but we do know that you know Donald Trump actually did make criminal justice reform with the first step act and the second chance I'm hiring that he focused on. Those were things that he focused on in his administration. But when it came down to the uh, the police reform bill, the and I think it was uh, June, uh, Tim Scott, the GOP version of the police reform bill, we know that that those things, so the limits on chokeholds, the ban, and in fact, Rand Paul had an amendment called the Breonna Taylor Act, which would have effectively banned chokeholds, I'm, I'm sorry, no not warrants, not just in drug cases, which is what the Democrats' proposals was, he actually done it where it would have affected the entire landscape, effectively banning them across the board. But what happened? We do know that Democrats, they filibustered it. They would not even allow it to come to the floor for a vote. So while we say that these are the things that we want our government to focus on, we actually don't do enough with pushing the, um, the, our, whether it's the Republican Party and especially the Democratic Party in addressing those things, because what killed the police reform bill ultimately was um, qualified immunity. What killed police reform in 2021 was qualified immunity. So all of these things that we talk about, we want the Biden administration to do, they have been addressed in some form, but our political landscape, our political um, um, apparatus in Washington decided that these things were not good enough. So we had to kill an entire bill where Democrats and Republicans agreed probably about on almost 90% of the things that were in the GOP bill, but because it did not have things like, um, you know, the, the qualified immunity and maybe a few other things, it died. So we need to, be, when we talk about what are the things that we want the federal government to do, we actually do need to look at what they're doing. And it's not just specific to a Republican versus Republican, from sorry, Republican versus Democrat administration. Well, that's where yeah, I have uh, I'm I'm sorry, I, I just have to jump in here because, because Robbie, you said that you're not sure if these are the top concerns of black voters. And I'm telling you that I talk to black voters every day, over 300 focus groups since 2020. And the number one or two issue for black voters is combating racism. That's in every poll that I've conducted, over 30,000 interviews. If racism and discrimination is not a number one or two issue amongst black voters, 
in polls that you're looking at, it's because they didn't ask it as an issue. This and, is the top concern. Yeah. And I actually, I'll just I, I ask a question. You know, that would shock me if that's the case, but all right. Yeah, but, but what I wanted, I think what we should, so when we say that racism is an issue that we want our federal government to focus on, let's talk about what policies that you're right. actually referencing. What is it that the federal government can do around combating racism? So let's talk about that. Sure, there are a number of things that Biden is doing now at the Department of Justice around civil rights. Um, and I can't think of the young lady's name who's now there. There are things that they're doing around that. But again, the federal government is limited in what it can do to actually address these issues. And we sort of superimpose um, upon the federal government things that are really happen at the local level. So I think we need to talk more about that. Well, I thank you both for this robust conversation. We could do a whole other segment on qualified immunity, what the policy prescriptions behind what uh, you know, solving racism or addressing racism really looks like, et cetera. And we'll have to have you back to keep this conversation going. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We, have to, we have to talk about the civil rights thing, Brick. Like, we, that, that, <laughs> Let's talk about that one, because yeah, will, I've talked will, about will, that actually We will definitely lot. come back and talk about the, the leaked civil rights case, which I think really does embody yes. a lot of the problems and the tensions with, between the black community and Joe Biden. But for now, we'll leave it there, and we'll have more rising for you after this.